What are we doing? <coughs> well, we're not in our break anymore. Um, this, is, this is Romans, and I call it simply Romans because people are so intimidated by Romans, they never want to read it. Uh, but it's really not that hard, really, if you just read it. So last week, what we looked at, we looked at this, and this is from chapter 1. He said, uh, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. That is, the people who don't have God's word, how will they know? Well, it's plain to them, and it's demonstrated to them in creation is what he talks about. And we looked at several pieces of creation like this that clearly point to the fact that there is a creator who is really pretty good at what he does, and there is a God. So it's plain to them, so they're without, without excuse. So last week he covered the fact that the people who don't have the word, don't have the law from the Jewish perspective, they're still without, they have no excuse because it turns out, he says very clearly, that what God as creator has made in this creation points to him so plainly that they have no excuse. And uh, if you want to find out what we were talking about last week, you can look online. I think it's online. Is it online, Scott? I don't know. Sooner or later, last week's sermon will be online. But, um, but it should be. Last week's is online, yeah. So you can look at it there because it really is it's a fascinating argument. It, many times when critics... Christian critics, uh, critics of Christendom, I should say, come and they say, well, what about the heathen in Africa? What about the ones who've never heard of Jesus? I mean, they're going to all be judged? Well, Paul says, yeah, because they know enough without, w- because of the creation, they're without excuse. God has made it plain to them what he's like. So go look at that. It's kind of an interesting thing, but it's an argument for those who don't have the word. And then he goes on and says in 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. So they knew who God was. It was plain to them. But they did two things, which is really the fundamental sin. They did not honor him as God and they didn't give thanks to him. They did not honor him as God and they didn't give thanks. And that's actually the core problem of mankind is mankind exists after the fall, disregarding who God is, and not giving him thanks for this incredible creation. So th- th- and that spins off a whole bunch of problems, and we looked at that last week. So these are the people who don't have the word, who are kind of uninformed. And today, he's going to talk more about them. I, that's, my, that's my iconic picture for the uninformed, because they always ask, how about the heathen in Africa? So <laughs> there they are, okay? Classically uninformed. So on the right, we talked about the uninformed last week, that they have no excuse. They're without excuse because of creation itself. It points to who God is. But then there's us. We would call ourselves the informed because look at what they got in their hands. Uh, yeah, they got Bibles and stuff like that. So what he's going to do right now, and we're going to cover this morning, he's going to transition his argument from the uninformed, people who don't have the word. Will they still be judged? Are they still accountable? Yes, they're without excuse. We know that for sure because of creation. But what about the people on the left, which includes you? What about the informed? Will you be judged? Ooh. So, so this is actually, just to give you a look forward, this is his transitioning his argument away from the heathen in Africa to the Jews at the time who are well informed about what's right and wrong. And he's going to say to both groups, both groups, excuse me, are without, a, are without excuse. Okay, so that's where he's going. But instead of just making this argument on the left Jews, think of yourself there, toting those Bibles around. Yes. So here's the question that's going to rule this morning. Does knowing right from wrong give you an advantage don't answer just think does knowing does knowing right from wrong give you an advantage does it because it's in a book does it give you an advantage and when i say advantage i say an advantage at judgment so hold on to that thought because there's there's a slight trick question in this so keep thinking so you can weigh that as we go along okay weigh that as we go along so here we go we're going to start in romans chapter 2 picking up from last week and verse 1 so focusing on us, the informed. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. So at least at the outset, knowing what's true and using that to judge other people, how dare you, don't you know that's wrong? Shame on you. We know what's wrong and you don't, right? That kind of judging. He says, the problem is, is that knowing the truth, knowing the right actions doesn't make you necessarily better. It just makes you a judge. See, because it turns out that they're practicing exactly the same things. So they're without excuse as well. So knowing right from wrong isn't something that enables you to do right. 
from wrong, necessarily. And as Paul's going to move on in his argument, he's going to talk about the fact that the Jews were kind of <coughs> kind of uppity about the fact that we have the law and we know right from wrong. Of course, the Gentiles and the heathens, they don't know, poor them, but we have, we've been entrusted with the law. And they kind of took this, this uppity, arrogant attitude that because they had the law, somehow they were fulfilling the law. But Paul says right off the top of the bat, no. And why? Because you're doing the same things. You judge other people for things that are in the law, and then you go and you do the same things yourself. So really, from the outset in chapter 2, does knowing right from wrong give us an advantage? Well, knowing right from wrong presents us with another danger, and that danger is the H word, hypocrisy. Knowing right from wrong, having a book that tells us right from wrong, <laughs> tempts us to judge other people who do wrong while we're doing the very same things ourselves. That's hypocrisy. Do what I say, not what I do. You ever have a parent say that? Do what I say, not what I do. But the fascinating thing, and this will be the backbone of what he'll talk about in a second, the fascinating thing is you are what you do, not so much what you say. Or put it another way, when nobody's looking, what do you do? And that will reflect who you really are. And that's what Paul's going to get in a second here. The Jews can walk around arrogantly and say, we have the right and the wrong statement in the law, but they're doing the same wrong thing. And that's hypocrisy. Do what I say, not what I do. And that's what he's going to jump on right here. Verse 2, so we know, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things, who do bad things. And what bad things are we talking about? Well, last week we saw them. Here they come. It's things like unrighteousness and evil and covetousness and malice and envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness and gossips and slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And aren't you glad, aren't you, glad you missed the... <laughs> and more. And that's just the beginning, doggone it. And that's the list he gave us last week. That's, that's what comes out of us. So, so what he's saying right here, we know the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. And what he's implying is those who are uninformed as well as those who are informed. If you do these things, you're still going to be judged. You're still going to be judged if you're doing these things. doesn't matter if you have a copy of the law or the word. If you're still doing those things, God judges that. Ooh. Verse 3. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you'll escape the judgment of God? So very clearly he's saying that. Just having the truth, and yet you still practice that bad stuff, you're in deep weeds, because you're still doing those things. That's hypocrisy, because you do them yourself. And by the way, <coughs> let me warn you, because right now if you're sitting in your seat saying, <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> <sighs> yes, you do. Well, I think we all do to a certain extent. To a certain extent, whether you're aware of it or not, we take an attitude because we have this word. We take this attitude saying we have this revealed thing right here and somehow just, be, just holding this somehow changes me and gets me off the hook come judgment. No. Being informed is not enough. And that's what he's going to get at right here because this, he's starting to hit at the problem of the Jews at the time who were given custody of God's law I mean, to show what it is and to carry it forward. And somehow they thought, they're thinking because they were graced by God of having this law that somehow just having it is enough and they're going to escape judgment. It's the Gentiles, the Jews would say, who are going to go through judgment. It's the Gentiles who don't know right from wrong. They're going to be judged. But us Jews, hey, we have the law. And Paul says, yeah, but you don't do it. You don't do it. We, we have this same disease. I just want to let you know that. So every time this comes up in this thing, don't say, it's a good thing I don't sin like that. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, okay. Just be forewarned. That's going to be the temptation. Verse 4, or, or do you presume on the riches and the kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you presume? I mean, what he's saying is that, okay, sure, you've got the law, but you're still doing these nasty, horrible things, ruthlessness. You're doing these things. Do you, do you presume that because God's not jumping on your parade today and judging you right now, that you're, gonna, you're, you're, you're presuming on the goodness of God because he's not reacting to this stuff in your life. And you're presuming on his goodness come judgment. <coughs> God's going to say, didn't you do those things? Well, yeah, but God, you know what? I've got the law. You're presuming on the goodness of God. 
God is going to judge those things, is what he's saying. It's, it's just like black and white. And a Jew has no advantage over a Gentile, informed versus uninformed. You're presuming on the goodness of God that because you're holding the law, you're holding his word, that somehow that gives you a get-out-of-jail free card come judgment. But if those things are still evidenced in your life, that list that went by, you've got deep problems. Jew and Gentile life. That's what he's getting at right here. Repentance is where this should aim toward. God's kindness is not meant to overlook your sin. God's kindness, that is his delay in judging, is meant to lead you to repentance. And, and, and I love this phrase. Did you realize that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? How, how does that work? Have you ever done anything really bad to somebody else? Semi-deliberately? Okay, deliberately. Did something bad. And in their graciousness afterwards, instead of coming to you really bent out of shape and mad and all that kind of stuff, instead they offer kindness to you? you even understanding what you've done to them. Have you ever had that experience? Because I have. And my response to that is it just crushes me. It just crushes It'd be easier for me to confront them while they're yelling at me saying, well, who do you think you are? And you'd come back, well, well you know, well, you deserve, you know, and it'd kind of inflame up. But when you get that kind of kindness in response, what that kindness response does to you is it moves you toward repentance. What was I thinking? That's a, that's a horrible thing that took place. I'm looking at that, and I'm confessing that, and I'm saying, I don't want that ever to come out of my life again. It stinks. It's awful. It's rotten. And it moves you to repent. Well, that's what he's saying about God's patience in judging you. That kindness from God is meant to move you to a rational condemnation of that sin and to seek repentance. Oh. <laughs> when you get defensive of sin, you've got a problem. But in the kindness of God, his kindness pushes us toward repentance for sin. That's what he's getting at. Don't presume upon God's goodness. It needs to push toward repentance. Verse 5. But... But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So what is the, what's the core problem? Is it that list of things that just went past? Well, those things are bad. I mean, don't take me wrong. Those things are bad. But what he's saying right here is your primary problem that issues all that stuff from is your heart. There's something that's whacked out about your heart. And he uses this idea of hard or impenitent. Hard literally means hard. I mean, it's like nothing emotionally moves you. You do harm to other people. You see the harm that affects in their life because you want to do something selfishly serving and you see the harm and your heart isn't moved by that because it's hard and cold. It's hard. Or impenitent means you're not going to look at the effects of your sin and it doesn't make you recoil and say, oh man, I i got to do something about this. This is horrible. I don't want this to be part of my life. That's repentance. That's penitence. He's saying your heart's impenitent. It, it, has, it has no sense of having to change because of the effects on other people's lives. Your heart. Did you know that, the, that back in Egypt when they would do mummies, that they would take out the organs? Remember that? they take out the organs before they mummified them and stuff like that. And, and do you know what they put in the place of the heart? They'd put a rock there. And you know why they put a rock there? is because in the afterlife, they didn't want these people, once they came to the afterlife, to be influenced by bad spirits who would lie to them, so they'd give them a heart that cannot be easily moved. So they'd give them a rock heart. Which gives you a brand new context for when Ezekiel says twice, God says, I'll change your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. A heart that feels, not a heart that's cold. Well, he's saying right here, here's your problem. You stand in judgment over other people doing bad things because you've got the law, but you're doing the same things. Your heart is cold and hard and impenitent to the, to the, the devastation that comes from your sin in other people's lives. It's hard. It doesn't react. Having the law, having the statement of right and wrong doesn't change you, and it doesn't give you any advantage. You're still doing the same thing. And as a result, because you're not responding, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. I mean, so literally what you can say to the Jews at the time and uppity Christians today 
is that because you're active in judging other people's sin, but you're not being active with dealing the sin in your own life, you're storing up for yourself at the time of judgment wrath on wrath from God. Sin is a desperately important matter. And as we move on through Romans, we need to figure out what to do about it. But if your heart is cold to it to start with, because somehow you think you've got the issue of right and wrong figured out, but nothing's changing, then something's desperately wrong. Desperately wrong. That's what he's getting at. We'll talk so much more about this as we go. If you have questions, write them down, because we'll hit a ton of these as we go on. Verse 6. He'll render to each one according to his works. This is God's judgment. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he'll give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. Read the informed as well as the uninformed. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, the informed, and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. That's a big statement. S- but you know, there's a kind of an interesting structure to it. Now let me show you the structure. You see, he starts with, he'll render to each one according to his works. For God shows no partiality. That's, that's what he's saying in this whole paragraph. He's going to render based on works. And God is not partial when it comes to works. If this person murders and this person murders, it doesn't matter if this one's a Gentile and this one's a Jew. It's murder. If this one betrays a friend and this one betrays a friend, doesn't matter what their background is, betraying a friend is condemned. So God's not partial. He doesn't care what kind of racial background or ethnic background you come from. Doesn't matter if you've got a copy of 16 Bibles in your house. If you're still doing these things, God's impartial. He's going to judge that thing. And then he explains it inside here. And here's how the structure goes. So there's the beginning and the end. He'll render to each one according to his works. Then finally, because God shows no partiality. And in the middle, he does this thing that we call a chiasma, a chiasm. And we've seen this before, where basically it's like a bullseye. It starts someplace, it works into the bullseye, and it turns around and works out of the bullseye back to the state stadium. So that's what he's going to do here. It goes in and it comes out. And he goes in like this. The first thing he says is, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he'll give eternal life. Well, by those who by patience in well-doing, and that means doing things, loving things toward other people, They seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Now that sounds very self-serving, glory, honor, and immortality, but he's using three code words that mean being with God for all eternity in heaven. That's what glory is. That's what immortality is. So what he's saying is that these people are are, are patient in their well-doing. They're actually living life as though the rewards of life aren't now. They're actually in the future, in glory. Immortality. They're living with an idea of where we're going in terms of judgment and long-term life. Those people, he said, their end, eternal life. And that eternal life means eternal life. It's eternal life. It's heaven. It's the, it's the results of salvation. Now, at this point, let me just summarize this in the green bar. Well-doing, seeking glory, honor, and mortality. At this point, you may be saying to yourself, and I hope you are, Wait a second, aren't we saved by faith and not our works? And if you come out of a Mormon background, that's what you'll be asking right now. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, All I can say is you need to hang on. You need to hang on. (laughs) Because in the, in the, the panorama of Romans, as we move along many chapters wide, you'll see the answer to that question. But but I'll sum up this acts thing, this this good works thing when we get to the end of this morning. But that should be triggering in your mind. And you should at least, as we're doing this, get the impression that sinful, sinful evidences on the outside of your life have a serious consequence undealt with. The question is, how do you deal with them? That's the question. So let's just keep moving. Just hold that question. So he's saying, uh, God's going to render to each one according to his works for those who actually push toward eternity, push toward God kind of things while doing, well, it's going to be eternal life. And then he talks about the bad guys. But those who are self-seeking and don't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there'll be wrath and fury. Again, it sounds like salvation by works, but you're not doing the works. But what's really key right here is it's characterized as those who are self-seeking. Now, that's a very important distinction. Do you know people who do good works 
uh, who, who actually apply themselves to do good works, and their motivation is themselves. So that you kind of build up points for eternity and that kind of stuff. So that somehow it'll come back uh, when judgment comes and build up to your account. So that if I have a whole life of, of really bad negatives and then I work hard at a life of good positives, that the balance will go like this and then at judgment time I'll be rendered okay. Right? They're doing it for themselves. But from a biblical definition, good works have nothing to do with you. If you benefit at all from your good works, then they're not good works at all they're self-serving and that <coughs> i've had this discussion on a number of occasions where people say well you christians you all seem to be against good works i mean you don't ever talk about good works in fact you're very careful to say that good works have nothing to do with salvation and that's true good works have nothing to do with salvation but you never talk about good works it's like but it's, it's all over the bible and we'll see this in a second so how can you not talk about good works at all and just talk about salvation by faith which by the way comes out of some verses in the next couple weeks. So you, you have to get a context here. But the issue is that if your good works are designed and implemented in your life to serve you and your interests, then suddenly you're earning for yourself and it's not a good work. Good works from a biblical definition ought to be self-sacrificial and have nothing to do with you. Remember Je Jesus talking about, he says, you need to be hospitable with people. You need to invite people to your house and love them and do things with them. But don't just invite the people who you know will return the favor and invite you to their house because all you're doing is getting an invite to their house by inviting them to your house. That's self-serving. But Jesus says, what should you do? Invite the people that can't repay you. Oh, so good works are actually has nothing to do with self-benefits at all. So in the future, if you have discussions about good works, separate it by that. Do these good works serve you in some sense, or do they serve others and nothing about you? Because that's the differentiation between the two. Okay, that's just a big deal. Self-seeking, they don't obey the truth, lots of unrighteousness, woo, wrath and fury from God. And then he, as he backs his way out, he's come into it, and now he's going to back his way out. He reiterates the bad again, and he says, verse 9, there'll be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, for the Jew, the informed person about the law, and also the Greek, the Gentile. There is bad repercussions from doing evil right there. And then as he continues to back out and works, he'll, he'll come back to the positive one again before he finishes. This is the symmetry of the whole thing, the chiasm here but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. Glory and honor and peace. And glory again is looking toward the end of time in judgment in that sense. Your rewards aren't here, they're there. Glory, honor, and peace. Honor is part of that and peace is part of the present results of doing good rather than doing evil. This should be creating a thousand questions in your mind <laughs> about the role of works in your life. It should be doing tons, tons. But the, the takeaway right here is really clear. Those whose lives continue to demonstrate evil have problems. The question still remains, what do you do about it? What do you do about it? And it's very clear that people that I know who, without anyone watching, continue to live lives of evil, I can tell them, you've got some deep problems going on. But they're inside. The evil on the outside is just an indicator. Now, there's some some deep problems right here. While on the same hand, I'll look at people who when no one's watching do tremendously loving things, almost giggling with delight when they do these things knowing that they won't be found out and they love doing it unseen and have no replication back to themselves. They're earning nothing, nothing. And I can look at those people and go, there's something remarkably different about that person over that person. See what I'm saying? So the actions are really a telltale sign and God's going to judge those actions. Okay, let me push on because a lot of these things you're just going to have to hold on in your uh, notes on the side. So what he's saying right here in summary, he's saying God's going to render to each one, that's the informed as well as the uninformed, according to his works because your works are an indelible indication of your heart's condition for God shows no partiality. So the informed and the uninformed, the informed have no advantage unless they demonstrate changed lives on the outside. So he goes on about the uninformed. 
Oh, let me just say this first. So the informed, I said it already, he's pointing toward the Jews, even toward us who have Bibles. And the uninformed, he's talking about Gentiles who have no information. But here's the interesting thing. Even though the Jews have the law, and there's a good picture of a Sefer Torah that's used in synagogues this very day, even though they have the law, which is a statement of right from wrong, it doesn't necessarily give them any advantage of judgment. God shows no partiality if you happen to have a scroll in your church like this. And he explains it right here, verse 12. For all who've sinned without the law will also perish without the law. That is, if they do evil, they're going to perish based on that. Because God shows no partiality, he judges according to works. It's very clear. Very clear. They will perish without the law. And, dun, 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 and all who have sinned under the law, that is Jews, they'll be judged by the law. So again, he's just, he's just emphasizing having a statement of right from wrong and doing right from wrong are not always connected together. And just because you know what's right and because you have God's word and God's law doesn't give you a free pass in judgment. God's going to judge the Gentiles based on what they do. God's going to judge the informed Jews based on what they do. There is no partiality with God. It still comes down to the evidences in your life that reflect your heart's condition. That's what he's getting to. So does knowing right from wrong give us an advantage? Well, there's the knowledge of right from wrong. It's the law from Paul's perspective. For us, it's the Bible. I mean, they're pretty synonymous right here. And it goes on. It hits us even harder. Verse 13. Listen, it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but it's the doers of the law who will be justified. Aren't we saved by faith and not by works? Ah. Yes. And he'll say it quite explicitly in a little while in Romans. So, but why does he say this? Why? I mean, well, because during their time, there was a rampant problem with hypocrisy on the part of the Jews, on the part of the Jews, where they would say, we have God's law and we have worked to refine what God's law means. So when it says respecting the Sabbath, we have figured out that respecting the Sabbath means not to walk more than this many steps from your house. And we have that truth. And once you obey this truth, God will love you and accept you. But they fail the law in terms of the heart requirements. Remember Jesus said that to him? He says, you, you Pharisees, you guys, you guys tithe mint and cumin. I mean, it's like, it's like the tiniest part of these laws that have been expanded by the Pharisees. You, you do all that stuff, but you're missing the big stuff. You're missing justice and things like that. So in one sense, yes, you're obeying the law. But in the most important sense, no, you're violating the law tremendously. Hmm. So this is what Jesus is getting at, and this is what Paul's trying to get at. There has to be something in the doing in your life that demonstrates that your heart is no longer hardened toward God's law. And, and I'll say this many times, that the, the outward actions that you do are really a, almost unconscious, slightly controllable, but deliberate outgrowth of the nature of your heart. You can... You can try and restrict the actions of your hands to not reveal the nastiness of your heart. And for those who live in religion, that's what the 99% do all the time is try and keep the inward truth of the heart from manifesting in your actions. At least having, having people think then you're better than you really are. But if you could open up your heart and say, yeah, but can I show you really how dark my heart is? They'd run away. Religious people spend their entire time trying to disconnect the evidences of the nature of their heart by changing the good works on the outside of their life. That's not as much the problem here. The problem with the Jews is the fact that the Jews state that because they just know the truth, that's a preventative to allow them to do the truth. And he's saying it has nothing to do with that. Knowing and hearing the law doesn't make you righteous. But... If there's something in your life that's doing the law, then something radical has changed in your heart. It should be doers of the law. So, and, so I mean, it's just, it's crazy to say, I, I love the idea of forgiveness, for instance. When I'm in debt to someone because I do something wrong, I love the idea of forgiveness. So I do this wrong to somebody or I go into debt to somebody and they come back to me, Jesus says, and they forgive your debt. And you go, oh, isn't forgiveness a wonderful thing? And then someone owes you a paltry, tiny sum. And you don't forgive them, but you bring down the wrath of heaven on them because they violated the fact that they're in debt to you and you can't forgive them. Do you really treasure forgiveness? Is forgiveness really a value in your heart? 
Or is it just a self-serving thing when someone forgives you that you don't forgive others? Which is exactly why Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, God's not going to forgive you because you've never, your heart's never changed in terms of your love for forgiveness. You're only self-serving when it goes to you, but you don't give it to anyone else. And uh, Jesus uses this many times. So there's something in the doing of the law. This is the question at this point. What does doing the law mean? And how do we make it happen? Because it seems like it's really important. <laughs> it is really important. So hold on to that thought. He's going to keep talking about this. Here's our unformed Gentiles. For when the Gentiles who don't have the law, they don't, they don't have that, when the Gentiles who don't have the law by nature do what the law requires, that is, loving your fellow man, they're a law to themselves even though they don't have the law. Now he's speaking kind of as a Jew, but what he's saying, okay, so, so these guys are uninformed. But there's something, there's something about them sometimes, not always, but sometimes, they do good. They act like they know the law. They act like they know right from wrong, even though they don't have the law. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Anthropologists look across the world in terms of isolated cultures and find that in every culture, there is a disdain for murder. There's a sense of right and wrong. Now, it's not totally consistent, but it is astonishingly consistent. Murder's wrong. Stealing's wrong. In interesting side case, betrayal's not always wrong. Uh, when, when, uh, I have to see if I get this story right, but I think it was when some Christian missionaries went down to Ecuador, I think it was, or it might have been New Guinea, so don't hold me to either one of those. But when they went to this native group that was there, they found out that one of their highest ethics was betrayal. Yeah, they thought in their culture it was a really cool deal and it made you a big man on campus if you could earn the trust of somebody else sufficiently that then you could betray them and take their life or do something bad to them. And if you could do that, woohoo, everyone said, you're the man. You're the best betrayer in our clan. And they had, an entire, they had a hard time trying to figure out how do you bring the gospel to a people whose ethics, at least in this area of betrayal, is so upside down. How do you, how do, you do this? Betrayal? Until they understood the fact that inside their culture, they found that there's this thing called a peace child. And if you've ever read this book, it's by that name. It's called Peace Child where a child is given from one tribe to another, and that the giving of that child from one tribe to another establishes a, a real basis for trust one another, and then betrayal is not important. So when the missionaries came in, they used that as their cultural connection in terms of their ethics. God sent his son to you as well. You can trust him. So betrayal, they got around the betrayal problem. Anyway, that's what goes on. There, it turns out that even though Gentiles are uninformed, formally speaking from the word, they still from time to time do things that are good, and they know that they're good. That's the astonishing thing. How is this possible? Verse 15, Paul says, they show that the work of the law ah, is written on their heart. So in some way which we can't quite explain, God, when he makes all of us, somehow writes on our hearts good from evil. We have some idea of what's good and what's evil. And as a result, our idea of good and evil that God has written on our hearts is going to turn around and condemn us if we go against it. And, but what, what, I, what I have to keep pleading for you is, like what Dave just did, keep the big, keep the big picture in Romans as we go along. Because um, if you focus in on just a verse and create a whole theology out of that, you're going to go wrong white places. Take the, take the context of the panorama of what he's talking about. And he'll, he'll do some of it here, but not all of it. Okay, so somehow the Gentiles are without excuse because they know right from wrong because God's put it there. And while their conscience also bears witness, or something about their conscience tells them that it's right or it's wrong, then as a result, their conflicting thoughts accuse them or excuse them on that day, on the judgment day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So he's just finishing this thought. Okay, so you're telling me the Gentiles are not informed. They shouldn't be judged. God says, no, they're without excuse. They've seen creation, and God has written on their hearts an understanding of good from evil, and... They consciously violated that good during their life. They're held accountable based on that. They're based accountable based upon what they see that's plain in creation about God and based upon what's been written on their hearts about good and evil. So they're not uninformed. They are informed. That's his point right here. Remember last week we talked about bad news? <laughs> uh, what Paul is doing in this section of Romans is he's giving us the bad news first and then he'll transition us to the good news. Because without a good understanding of the bad news, the good news just doesn't look so good. 
if you don't need to be saved, then why do you need a Savior? That's kind of where we're coming from. Well, this is his bad news, and he's, he's going to go from chapter 1 to chapter 2 to the middle of chapter 3 and talk about the bad news. And he's right smacked up. He's chest deep in bad news right now. Whether you're informed or you're uninformed, you're held accountable based on your actions. Because your actions don't lie about the nature of your heart. That's what he's getting at right here. So here's the summary. And I'm gonna, I'll do a quick summary right here because we're going to stop doing new verses because this is, this is enough. I can't take anymore. Teacher, my brain is full. Okay, so here's the summary up to this point. God's judgment is coming for sure. It's coming. And none of us is, without, is with excuse. It's rendered according to our deeds. Won't be hearers, but doers of the word. There's two outcomes, some that will perish and some that will find eternal life. And all are without excuse, all implying the informed and the uninformed because actually all mankind is informed, whether you have the written word or not. That's what he's getting at. So you Jews, and this is where he'll go to next week, you Jews who think that you got something special going on because you got the word, (laughs) you're still doing the same bad stuff. Something tells me that something isn't transformed in the hardness of your hearts. Something's not transformed right there. So what's the remedy? That's the number one question today. Okay, so if God's going to judge me according to my deeds, what's the remedy? Is the remedy, very obviously, do more good? It sounds like it. And that would be a natural conclusion. There's there's really nothing wrong with that conclusion if you don't read the rest of Romans. Just do more good. If God's going to judge me based on my actions, I'll change my actions. Right? Right? If you don't want to go to jail, obey the law. Obey the law, you won't go to jail. Okay, I'll do more of that kind of stuff. That sounds right. <laughs> but as a remedy, it's fraught with problems. And, and let, me, let me explain it to you. Because remember, he says this, and we're not we're glossing over this verse. For it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Therefore, You need to do the law. The end. No, it turns out it's not. If you stop reading right here, that's what you'll be. That's what you'll be tempted to think. And uh, you know, I'm I'm a student of Mormon theology as well. So I, you know, I wondered how this is handled in some some circles. And here's uh, David Ridges, who's LDS. Um, He he's been in CES for uh, like forever, three four decades or something like that. He he writes a lot of books (coughs) about Mormon. This is called Mormon Beliefs and Doctrines Made Easier. They're not, but it helps a little bit. But he, he, he writes right here, and this is interesting, in the section on uh, faith and works. Now, this is LDS. This isn't, this isn't Christian. He says, uh, he says uh, on the other hand, after he talks about faith, in Romans 2.13, here it is. In Romans 2.13, Paul's audience consists of Gentile converts to the church who are not as concerned as they should be about works. Well, first off, he's not talking about Gentile converts. He's talking about Jews right here. Uh, David, come on, get your act together. But he says, rather, they're thinking that since they've been baptized and are members, they don't need much else. Therefore, Paul's emphasis to them is that they must pay much closer attention to righteous works and deeds, including avoiding sin and unrighteous behaviors. Well, that's, that's this. Do more good. Just do more good. But David Ridges hasn't read the rest of Romans. <laughs> That's cherry picking, exactly. That's going into one verse, that verse right there, which we're not ignoring, but you need to put it in the context of the panorama of what Paul's talking about. And, uh, and, and you can disagree with me or agree with me later on, but what he's going to get at is, is that what you evidence in the outward works of your life is a perfect indicator of the status of your heart. You can try and phony it, but you're not going to get very far. You can try and phony it, but it won't be right. And God is going to judge the heart and the secret places. The outward stuff is supposed to be a clue for you that you're messed up. And it's not going to be what you say, it's going to be what you do because it's a, it's a great indicator of who you are. It really is. When someone's not looking, what do you do? That's what God's going to judge because it's a, it's a pretty accurate indicator. So doers of the law, that's supposed to be the clue to you that something's messed up. So what do we do? Do we just do more good Well, let me propose this. Knowing the law does not save you. He's already told us this. Just knowing it. Just knowing it. Well, I know the Ten Commandments, so God needs to let me into heaven. No. You don't do the Ten Commandments. But actually, it's worse than that. If if you want to try, I I tested this. If you want to try saying, okay, 
We just need to do more good. What's a good list to measure doing more good? He already gave it to us in chapter 1. The opposite. Check this out. See, we think that knowing the law is going to eventually ooze out of our outside to becoming doers of the law. But that connection is not a given. And that's what he's saying. You know the law. You condemn people because they do bad things. And yet you presume that you're doing them on the outside, but you're not doing them. So something is disconnected between what you know is right and wrong and your ability to actually do them. And that disconnect is the heart of what Romans is about. What is that disconnect? In fact, he says, although they knew God, they did not honor him or give, honor him as God or give thanks to him. This is from the previous chapter. That's actually the fundamental sin right there, disavowing God altogether. And that's what we're supposed to be doing is honoring God. Maybe that's more core to what we're supposed to be doing as a remedy for the sins that out us as being sinners. Maybe there's something about, because remember in chapter 1, we go back, he said that the fundamental problem is they don't honor God as being God and they don't thank him. And then it opens up this floodgate as God gives them over and it says right here, right after that, he says, therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. Okay, wait a second. I thought with the Gentiles... They had the law written on their heart, good and evil. And as a result, they can do some good because they know what's good and they know what's wrong. Well, and here, just the last breath in the previous chapter, he says, but wait a second, their hearts, look at their hearts. God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts and impurity. So somehow, inside this thing we call our hearts, which is our affections and the things we point toward, there's a mixed bag going on in here. Like somehow, God has written enough of his law that we know right from wrong but when God removes his restraint in our lives, the ugliness of also what's there turns into all this junk. And that's actually true. The heart is desperately wicked. It really is. But yet still God has written some understanding of good and evil. But what is it that God, this is what I want to get back to. If you want to get back to doing more good, he said that if we disregard who God is, God gives us up to the lusts of our heart and all this bad stuff happens. What bad stuff? Well, our hearts are the source of all this bad stuff. These things that we're supposed to be doers of the law, but now our hearts actually naturally flow out junk. And here's the junk. Remember what we said last week? They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. This is what's in your heart, and this is how it works out to the outside of your life. You got evil. Um, uncovetousness. You got malice. You got envy. You got murder. You got strife. You got deceit. Uh, maliciousness. You got gossips. You got slanderers. You got haters of God. Uh, insolent people who envy. You got haughty people, a boastful, inventors of evil, uh, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. So the challenge is, if you're going to stop on Romans 2.13 and say, I need to do more good, then this is what you've got to eradicate out of your life, which is a natural outflow of the lusts of your heart. This is what you've got to change. Now, I put these things on two sides of this body. You see what's different about the left list from the right list? These all come straight out of Romans 1. The stuff on the right side is a state of your heart, not an action of your hands. So as Jesus did for us in Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, he's upping the ante. It's not, it's not just the matter of you keeping yourself from murdering people. You have to change the nature of your heart so you stop hating people. Oh, well, God won't take it that bad if I don't murder them. Yeah. Jesus says that he will. The nature of your heart's the key issue. That's what God judges. And if you successfully are keeping the nature of your heart from working itself out into murder, if you still hate, you're a murderer. If you still lust and you don't follow through with adultery, you're still an adulterer. It's the nature of the heart that's at issue. And it's the actions of the outside of your life that's supposed to give you a clue to how messed up your heart is. So, this is the challenge. If you think that at Romans 2.13... You know, don't be just hearers, but be doers. The challenge is being a doer is to fix all the things on the left side here, which is not too hard to do, but you also got to fix everything on the right side, which is, I submit, impossible to do. That's the problem. Because God's going to judge the secrets of your heart. God's going to look inside. Now what God, so, so, so you say, well then why did God talk through Paul and spend so much time talking about the fact he's going to judge us based on our works? I mean, isn't that a ruse? Aren't we supposed to go and just do more good things so our works will balance out? Yeah, but here's the deal. A life that
that's truly transformed by the living God living inside you does bring transformation, starting with your heart and that heart issuing out to transformed actions. The law is written on your heart and the, and the idea of good and evil and serving God is written right there. And somehow in, in what God does in the way that we can't fully explain through his Holy Spirit, he starts to change the desires and the intentions of your heart. And as a result, the actions start to change as well. And then as a, as a body of integrity, of one, both the desires of the heart and the actions of the hands, you're one in terms of loving the good. Now, like I said before, you can try, you can try and have a nasty, fallen heart that has all of this stuff oozing around inside of it, and you can try on the left side of this list to modify the actions of your hands so that you look gooder than you are. And in bad religion, that's what's done constantly. <coughs> constantly. Constantly. Hiding the nature of who you are. Hoping that people will think you're gooder than you really are. And hoping that even in some religious context, when God judges, he'll look at all that kind of stuff. And you'll get there and you'll say, God, I never murdered anybody. And you'll say, yeah, but you hated so many. It's the same thing. But I didn't murder. But, he, but he should, he's, trying to, he's trying to elicit with you a sense of unease if there are bad things in your life on the outside. And he's trying to point you as a, I like a prototype Jew in that sense. He's trying to point you to the idea that there's something about the nature of your heart that's really more at, at a problem here. And that's going to be judged more keenly than your actions. And it's very hard to change your heart. I, I would say it's almost impossible to change your heart. So what God's looking for when he's talking about if you'll be my people, I'll be your God, that's the statement of salvation from an Old Testament context. My people, he would say, are the people who love mercy. They love love. They do justice for the benefit of other people. These are people who actually, uh, they model the things that I'm concerned about, my heart. God says my heart loves these things and my people will love these things as well. But if my people, like the Pharisees and the Jews at the time of Jesus, didn't love those things, but they tried to apply them on the outside of their lives, while they still kind of chafed inside at having to do it, they're not acting like his people. See the distinction? It's the same thing as if you went to traffic court. <coughs> I've been there a couple times. <coughs> Guilty. You go to traffic court, and you go to traffic court, and they say to you, listen, you're going 10 miles over the speed limit. So because the law is the law, and you were 10 miles over the speed limit, you've got to pay a fine. Well, you know, I tried to argue it a couple times. It wasn't very successful. <laughs> and if it was as simple as that, it, it seems like I can do. I can change my actions and be righteous if it's like that. But, but, what if the judge went one step further? And he says, oh, yeah, you were speeding. You're going 10 miles over. But do you know that there's children in that neighborhood who don't understand how to live with cars on the street. And do you know you're 10 miles over the speed limit, put them all at danger? Do you know that there's people in the past because of their reckless selfishness of wanting to get where they're going faster, have gone faster and killed children? You have such a total disregard for the well-being of other people. You selfishly think your agenda is more important than everyone else's, and so you speed putting people in danger. Shame on you. Your heart is so careless and uncaring for other people. And unfortunately, that's true. God's going to judge us based on the fact that we don't incorporate into our hearts the nature of the law that works its way out to us voluntarily obeying the speed limit. It really, and obeying a speed limit is a symptom of a changed heart. Now, if you take everything that we do and you think that I can become, I can become acceptable to God if I just obey the speed limit in all the ethical parts of life, but your heart still chafes and your heart is still faithless and foolish and heartless and inventing evil, you're hating God, you're envy, you're haughty, you're insolent, but I do all the right things. And God says, I don't care. I want someone who's one of mine who from the inside out is radically changed to be like me. The standard is so high. And again, that's why Jesus spent Matthew 5, read it, about why it is that the nature of the heart is as important as the nature of your actions. But make no mistake, your actions will reflect the nature of your heart when no one's looking. So when you get to the judgment, God's going to say, I saw you do these things. It tells me your heart's like this. And it should have been telling you your heart's like this all along. 
why didn't it have any effect? Right. Why didn't you look at that and say, I've got a real problem? Why, why didn't you take a few steps and say, something's got to change? Why didn't that ever occur to you that the darkness of your heart is the real center of your problem and all your actions were screaming at you saying, you're a dirtbag, doesn't that, doesn't that bother you? Your actions are meant to tell you what's, in, what's going on inside you. That's why you can't fake that. You can try, but it doesn't get very far. It just doesn't get very far. The nature of God's judgment is he wants to look inside us and see a transformed heart. And thank God, thank God, the remedy for this problem is not in your power. But it's still a problem. (laughs) And that's the thing. We'll read later, and Jason brought this up, we'll read later. So then why the law? Why bring the law up? Even if the Gentiles are failing because they'll have the law, why did God give us the law, the statement of right and wrong? And he says, so you'll get a clue that you're a sinner. So it will actually heighten the problem of what's inside. I can't see what's in there. But when you look at your actions and you place them against the law, your actions tell you what's in there. And that's the nature of the law. So, so then I just do more good. No, no, no. Not when it involves issues like this. Until you told me I shouldn't be doing that. That actually comes up later. It's several chapters post here. I think it is, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I didn't, wasn't worried about it, but once you said it was a law, then all of a sudden I... Then I want to do it. Then I want to do it. Yeah. And, and, and so here's, here's the bottom line. The issue isn't whether or not we are sinful. We are sinful. And he just spent chapter one telling us that everyone's sinful. No, no one's with excuse. I mean, we're all, we're all dirtbags. We're all selfishly consumed with us. We're stuck on ourselves. And this selfishness for me, sin and selfishness are virtually synonymous. That kind of terminal selfishness is what happened at the fall. That's what happened. And from now on out, you're stuck trying to make yourself the center of the universe and making everything in the universe serve you. That's selfishness. But something about the transformed life, and this, this is the paradox, the transformed life that comes to follow Jesus and to accept his payment on our behalf and his spirit comes into us, starts to turn this terminal selfishness, this self-inwardness, and starts to turn it out into concern for others rather than concern for ourselves. I mean, that's just a natural outgrowth of that kind of a heart because we have experienced the loving kindness of God who came to bring us to himself, who forgave our sins and paid for our sins through what Christ did for us. And as a result, his spirit comes in us and he starts to rework the inside of us so that our hearts and our actions start to look more like him. And that's the whole topic of regeneration in the New Testament. But make no mistake, everyone is informed. And that's really the takeaway from this morning. Everyone's informed. Gentile, heathen in Africa, Jew, Christian who's got a Bible. No one's with excuse. And just knowing right from wrong doesn't save you from the consequences of right and wrong. Just knowing it. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll realize that the things that you want to change and being a doer of the law are impossible. They're impossible. Uh, Almost every story I've heard of someone who's come to Christ, especially ones late in life, they come to Christ and one of the first, one of the first events they have is they come to this radical understanding of their sinfulness. I heard I heard John DeLynn, who's an LDS blogger from Logan, interview Sandra Tanner, who came out of Mormonism back in the sixties and he said, how do, how, do you know, how do you know that your experience is, is real coming to Christ? How do you know that? And she, uh, she hesitated for a second, and then she said, well, all I know is I sat on my couch and cried for hours about my sin. There's this, there's this deep understanding that the inside of me isn't fundamentally good. It's fundamentally warped. And there's a despair that comes with that, like, how can that change? How will that ever be acceptable to God? How will I ever be lovable to anybody with this condition? And so Sanders said, I sat on my couch and cried for hours. Same is true of other friends I've known. I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, Sean McCraney. Many of you have seen Sean McCraney on TV. Talked to him once. And he said, yeah, I was driving my car and I was listening to the radio and there's some preacher on there. And I've listened to these preachers all the time and made fun of them and thought, what jerks they are. They don't know what they're talking about. But something this one guy said, he didn't say it eloquently, but suddenly understood I was deeply sinful 
And then I looked back on my life and tried to make myself good over and over and over, and all I did was fail at it. And he said, I had to pull off the side of the road and go to the shoulder of the road, and I started crying when I realized how dark this was. And is there anyone that can save me from this darkness? And God says, yeah, me. So really, the good news of salvation is built on really a a spirit-driven understanding of the sinfulness of yourself. And that's what Paul's getting at here. And all he wants to get, let you know in this first section we finished with today is just because you got a family Bible sitting on the hearth at home, it doesn't save you. Just because you have the law, the Torah, as a Jew sitting somewhere close by, it doesn't save you. All it's doing is it's serving notice to you that you're really messed up. <laughs> and if you want the loving kindness of God, you're going to have to understand his plan to pay for that messed upness, and you're going to have to yield to him the whole job of fixing it. This very day when I sin, and I've sinned many times this week, <gasps> shocking, really. When I sin, I go to God and I say, I hate that stuff. I mean, I just hate that stuff. I look forward to the day where it's not only not a part of my life, but it's not a part of the air I breathe and the people that are around me. I hate sin. And it's not just because I feel guilty. It's because he's changed something in my heart where I look at it and it's just ugly. Uglier than it's ever been before. And on the smallest issues, you would say, it's ugly. Because there's something so self-destructive about sin. There's something so separating between me and God because of sin. And I go to God and I say, God, thank you that you paid for this sin as well on the cross through Jesus. There's nothing I could do about that. But God, I yearn for the day when it's not even a component of my life. Not just because I'm trying to make myself worthy to you, because I'm already worthy to you. Christ died for me already. But because sin is horrible and it hurts people, people around me, myself, it's destructive. It's self-destructive. Now, if, if the sin in your life is not bringing you back to more dependence on God, if it instead the sin in your life is bringing you to guilt about having to do more good, then you, you misunderstood. You misunderstood. Every sin you've ever done and ever will do has been paid on the cross by Christ through his blood. And you can take that to the bank. It's there but we still live waist deep in a cesspool of sin. Some of it's in us, some of it's in everything around us. And God is in the process of delivering that out of us and delivering us from the influence of it here. Until people start looking at you and saying, you know, I noticed on the outside of your life, you do all these things and you're doing them without any chance, uh, without any interest in being paid back for it. You're just doing it because, because, because you love people? How can that be? And you say, because he first loved me. And he's changing me. It has nothing to do with earning salvation. It has everything to do with falling more in love with this God who, while I yet sinned, he died for me. And so you're a walking testimony to that loving kindness. No longer trapped in this religious expectation that you have to make the outside of your life clean because unfortunately you've got to make the inside of your life clean and that's impossible. No longer trapped in that. But now, now, you're captivated by the love of God. And you come to him repeatedly and say, God, I want more of you and less of this. I want more of you and less of this. And unfortunately, there's still pieces of it in here. Can you clean this out? Can you, can you ream this out? Can you do something with this? Because I hate that this is part of my life. God, that's your job. The remedy is not in our power. It's in his power. And so we constantly go back to him, and he changes us. That's the regeneration. That's sanctification. That's coming to understand the law. Now, one last PS. <coughs> if you go back to Psalm 119, Psalm 119, the psalmist writes, How I love your law, O God. And the first time I read that, I thought, Well, that's just like crazy talk. Oh, city of Brigham City, how I love your speed limits. In the downtown. No. But if I keep on that metaphor, oh, how I love those who've incorporated in their lives a constant awareness of the need of others and the danger you might put them in by. Oh, how I love that. I love that. 
Because God's law is the embodiment of his love for mankind worked out in our flesh. And so the psalmist says over and over and over, oh, how I love this. Because the context of where I live is full of foolishness and heartlessness and ruthlessness. (sighs) Evil being invented, haughtiness, people think more of themselves, insolence. But God, when I look at you and I look at your law, I go, that's what I want. But you'll never be able to construct it in yourself just because you got the list. And he'll go, he'll, if, if your intention right now because you, uh, works, grace, faith, works, grace, faith, ah, just hold on. Or you can put yourself out of your misery and you can read ahead. Because <coughs> this is exactly where he's going to go. But just today, all he wants you to know is understanding is that just because you have the list doesn't guarantee you'll do the list. It doesn't. In fact, he'll make a case that no one does the list. So why the list? To bring us in need to him as the remedy. Okay, let's quit. Heavy duty stuff. Fire hose morning. (laughs) Read ahead if you still have problems. Let's pray. Father, I don't think I know the half of what I'm talking about here. But, but I do know some of it. And Lord, I ask you to forgive me for the times when I do act kind of haughty, act like just because I've got the list, somehow I'm, I'm in better stead with you. And yet there, the actions of my hands and the words of my mouth condemn me. And they show that there's still pieces of me that aren't regenerated. There's still pieces of me that cling to, cling to sin thinking that somehow it's a valuable component in the tools of life. And it's, it's just not. And Lord, we look around us, not only in our lives, but the people around us, and, and we see the destruction that sin does. We see the destruction that self-interest builds in people's lives. Oh Lord, we, you have come to us, you have called to us, and through your Spirit you've given us an understanding of the depths of our condition. And Lord, as we go through these first parts of Romans, I pray you'd continue to impress upon us the depths, the darkness of our condition so that when the good news arrives, the remedy for all this, to the, the remedy to the universal darkness that we all find ourselves in, whether we feel informed or uninformed, the remedy will be you. And the remedy will be such, such good news. Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness, your love that persists and in patience perseveres beyond our silliness and our foolishness. We thank you that in all of that, you've called us to yourself and without being worthy, you died for us. Our worthiness had nothing to do with it. But somehow through the, through the darkness of our hearts and the despair of our emotions, you've communicated to us your love for us. And that amazes us because how can you love someone like me? You see me. I fake out other people with what I do, but you see me. And yet you love me. And yet you love me. And that's just astonishing. So God, as we push forward, clear away the, <coughs> clear away the webs in our mind for our understanding. Allow your spirit to speak powerful truths to us about the desperate darkness of the bad news and the wonderful lightness of the good news so that we might draw an even closer to you and closer in dependence even for what happens tomorrow and the day after that. We're yours and we're delighted to be known as yours, astonished to be yours, adopted into a family we're never born into, and yet that we enjoy all the privileges of this great king and this great God who loved us because he loved us, because he's loved. So thank you for all this now, in Jesus' name. Amen.